Luke McCormack. Good afternoon and welcome to this month's show. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss best practices with emergency communication strategies in the federal government. With me on today's show are Rear Admiral Ron Hewitt, Director, Office of Emergency Communications, Department of Homeland Security. Mark Lucero, Chief Engineer, Integrated Public Alert and Warning System with the FEMA. Michael Dent, Chief Information Security Officer, Fairfax County, Virginia. Kent Cadell, Director, Business Continuity and Emergency Management, Verizon. And Scott Landau, Director of Business Development, Panasonic Mobile Solutions. Well, this is a great topic and a very important one. This is what uh, keeps our community safe. And uh, boy, with this tectonic shift in technology, the digitization, you know, lowering the footprint, the form factor changing, uh, all kinds of capability that you can put into this technology now, it's just remarkable what's happening. And so uh, let's start with you, um, Ron. Tell us about uh, what's going on over at Department of Homeland Security and uh, in emergency comms and uh, what, what's been the progress over the last year. Well, thanks, Luke. And, uh, Thanks for having me on the show today to discuss what the Office of Emergency Communications is doing to help public safety communicate during those disasters. And uh, just to give you a little background, when, when a uh, disaster does happen, there is multiple public safety agencies that come together uh, to respond to that incident. And so it is critical that they come with common practices, techniques, and procedures. And so they follow FEMA's national incident management system and we're responsible for helping train public safety officials in the communications unit in the incident command system which supports uh, the uh, response and recovery efforts. And with that, we've trained over uh, 10,000 communications leaders and technicians across the country to ensure whenever a major incident does occur, like this upcoming uh, Fourth of July fireworks, that uh, there will be interoperability between all the responders and, and be able to, uh, to work with that. And so in the past, Public safety has primi primi primarily relied on land mobile radio systems and with that we've been uh, teaching them how to uh, develop a communications plan so all the responders would be able to interoperate. But as they start moving into uh, more uh, cellular commercial broadband capabilities, we're now uh, moving the courses to cover both an land mobile radio and a cellular long-term evolution LTE fourth generation uh, uh, capability so that we have interoperability in a, in a uh, integrated environment. Right, we've got a couple of our key vendors here that I'm sure we'll talk about that, a big part of making that solution happen across the community. Uh, Mark, how about at FEMA? Tell us about what's going on with the uh, public alert system and maybe talk about what is that yep. so people know and then uh, where, where you guys are as far as the program is concerned. Sure, Luke, thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I think it probably goes without saying the last year has been very, very busy for FEMA sure. and as it has been with the IPAWS program. Uh, IPAWS is the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. Um, it is a uh, a system that uh, allows state and local emergency managers, public safety, to issue protective actions to the public over their cell phones uh, with wireless emergency alerts, and then also over TV and radio with the traditional EAS emergency alert system. Uh, so to date, we've got um, about 1,100 uh, state and local government entities that can use the system to send those protective actions. And in, over the past year, with the wildfires and with the hurricanes we've seen, uh, a great uptick in the usage of the system, which is great. People are using it uh, with with great effect. Unfortunate um, that they have to use it, but good exactly. that it's there. That's right. That's right. Uh, in fact, uh, in in Puerto Rico, uh, one of the teams that we have down there um, just this week, uh, led by Manny Centeno from my office, uh, they worked with. Uh, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico uh, Emergency Management Agency to uh, install, integrate, uh, train, and test with the system so that so now they're, uh, they're able to issue those protective actions to the people uh, on the island. Uh, and just this, uh, this Tuesday, they, they did a very successful test. They lit up all the cell phones on the island. Uh, they issued alerts to TV and radio down there. So we're very proud of the work that's been, been done down there by Puerto Rico and, of course, uh, by 
our folks in the office. And so if I remember right, is, is FEMA doesn't actually issue the warnings and alerts. That they're actually uh, responsible for setting up the standards, integrating all of the, uh, the platform so that the state and locals, et cetera, can issue these alerts and warnings, That's right? That's exactly that right. That works? That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, we maintain the systems. Uh, we don't send the alerts. FEMA does not send the alerts. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do coordinate with those state and local entities to make sure that they are prepared to do so, uh, sure. provide training and sure. such. And Michael, let's talk about what's happening at Fairfax County. It's one of the most sophisticated counties in the country. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there's uh, an extensive amount of uh, uh, emergency comm capability within the county. So uh, tell us about what's going on in Fairfax. Well, it, along with Mark, with what you just said, so you know, I know our emergency management agency is using the system. Um, I think we had a couple uh, incidents happen last week where that system was actually used for our uh, county, uh, mm -hmm. for our citizens, and it goes to our citizens, employees, you name it. I mean, we get it. But for in, in Fairfax, I mean, we we've taken emergency management communication, I think, a lot farther than what most locals do. Uh, in that one, we're, being where we're at here in the national capital region. Um, we're a part of what we call the NCR, and it's a network of networks, private fiber between all those local jurisdictions. There's 22 in this region. We've integrated fiber for public safety communications for our first responders. Um, we've uh, federated identities for those uh, entities so that they're using one user ID, password. There's not a multiple of them having to remember for the different systems. And right now, the uh, the, the effort we have is trying to move as many of those public safety systems out there over to that private network. Um, it, it's all private fiber we all own in our own jurisdictions. Um, so that, you know, in the event if there is another disaster, if the carriers would, were to go down, we wouldn't be relying on their communications for those first responders to talk. Um, and then it's, you know, the uh, emergency alert network. It is highly used in our county. Our citizens, you know, we, we have some of the, I guess the higher uh, information technology companies that are in our county and those employees live there. Mm -hmm. So they're all using it and it, it, uh, it does great. And I love the coordination to where we get the traffic through it, we get, we get weather, we get you name it, all that information comes through that network as well. So. Wow, it sounds extremely sophisticated uh, environment that you've built there. And I know a lot of the counties across the uh, country, quite frankly, follow sort of the lead of what happens at Fairfax County. Scott, how about at Panasonic? I mean, this is a, uh, uh, a sort of a, a booming area right now in regards to all the different types of technology to plug into this fabric, if you will. Tell us what's going on at Panasonic and uh, how the programs are going over there. Thanks, Luke. So this is a very special year for Panasonic. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary as a company. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it's really exciting because we also are celebrating 22 years with our rugged computers, which is Toughbook. Right. And I think we've been successful because we have become part of the community of first responders and mm -hmm. federal government listening to our customers. So we've really, you know, you mentioned early on that there's such a difference in form factors now. So we probably have the broadest portfolio ever of everything from a handheld all the way through a tough book with a two-in-one detachable tablet. So what we're finding today is the mission changes throughout the day, right? So everyone comes to work expecting a certain typical way of doing business, but with all of the tragedies and excitement that goes on, there's really a big change. So having flexibility with that is really important. As we continue to talk to customers, what they've asked for is, why can I talk to my smartphone, but I can't talk to my tough book? Mm -hmm. So we've started integrating four microphones into a tough book. We've started looking at things like infrared to do facial recognition, because it was mentioned early on by Mike that one of the challenges for first responders is having multiple sign-ons. You know, today there's so much big data available to our users, but what they find is they'll have 14 or 15 windows open with multiple passwords. I think we all experience that in our own lives, right? Having so many different passwords for everything we want to do. <coughs> so now we've introduced role-based authentication, Siege's conformance. We've introduced the ability that we'll talk about that's going to lend it to some solutions that are going to help solve problems beyond the tough book. And I think as we talk through this program, you'll see some exciting things working on it. Right, with the miniaturization of, of these technologies, et cetera, um, 
uh, opens up a lot of capabilities and, and having access to all this data. But at the end of the day, look, these responders are out in the field. Right. They're in an emergency situation. It needs to be simple to use. Uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, very interested to hear more about uh, sort of the, uh, the use cases there as well. Right. Kent, let's talk about Verizon. You guys have been there from the beginning. Uh, you're a major player in the uh, emergency response sort of ecosystem and the fabric. Uh, tell us what's happening at Verizon these days in regards to uh, emergency response. Thank you. Response. Uh, first, I'd like to start by saying we fully recognize, as the other panelists have talked about, the importance of keeping people connected, especially during a crisis, and especially for first responders and the government agencies that uh, we support. And, and that preparation begins with building resilient networks that will be able to withstand the impact of a major incident. And that begins with the where site selection, the way we design and build our networks, and the way we maintain them, uh, keeping diverse uh, network paths, uh, multiple layers of power backup in case commercial power is not available, and uh, the resiliency to withstand that. Uh, I'm very proud to say that when we uh, went through Harvey and Irma last uh, fall, we had a 98% uh, reliability across the network. 98% of our network locations stayed online. Wow. Uh, but, you know, that 2% is uh, also very important in responding to that. Uh, part of our credo is that we run to a crisis. It's part of our company's DNA and that when something like uh, a Harvey or an Irma happens, that we are able to quickly respond and support uh, the first responders that are helping the communities that uh, we are in. Um, and uh, I would like to bring out a couple of points there. Uh, first, we've increased our ability to remotely access our cell towers and redirect radios uh, so that we can mitigate some of the impact. Uh, we have a wide uh, number of mobile assets that we can deploy to help mitigate any uh, impact to our network. And then, of course, we have our Verizon response team that is there uh, supporting the first responders and making sure that they have the communication capability that they need uh, to respond to during a crisis. Um, it's been a, uh, a you know, history of continuing to refine and improve those capabilities, and I think we saw the result of that in the uh, hurricanes last fall. Yeah, I mean, Mother Nature is giving us a run for our uh, money here, and, uh, you know, when you think about carrier class, right, as we all like to call it in the industry, you think about uh, some of the... Uh, industrial strength type of things that you're describing there, which is great because in that time of need, you know, those first responders need to be able to, uh, to, to, to show up and do their job, right, uh, for the citizens. And also the citizens need that calm too for the emergency response. So, Mark, uh, let's, let's jump over to you. I'd like to talk about just specific programs and maybe you can highlight a program uh, that you guys are working on that could be of interest to uh, the listening audience in regards to uh, what's going on with public alerts. You're certainly getting tasks uh, and, and tax these days as far as the use of it. Yes. Um, yeah, let's talk about uh, a specific program. Okay, um, so not necessarily a program, but there was a, a piece of legislation passed uh, recently called the IPAWS Modernization Act, mm -hmm. um, and that's going to have some, some dramatic impact on the program. Um, what it is, it's a, a a piece of legislation that that creates a, a subcommittee to the National Advisory Council, uh, and they are charged with um, uh, and and Ron Hewitt is is part of that uh, subcommittee. Uh, they're charged with um, providing recommendations to FEMA to make improvements to the system, and uh, they're looking at uh, different aspects. One of which being uh, the the people who create the alerts. How can we uh, make improvements to to their interfaces and the systems that they use? Um, another is the public response and reaction to alerts. Uh, how can we use uh, social science to uh, determine how best to create those alert messages to make sure that the public takes those protective actions when they get them? Uh, and um, in addition to that, uh, people with access and functional needs uh, are, are vastly in increasing aging population, uh, deaf, blind, hard of hearing. Uh, we need to make sure that those uh, alerts are accessible and, and that those folks can receive and, and take action on those as well. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's, uh, as you, you look to change these technologies, you need to make sure that it's compliant with the entire community. Uh, Scott, how about you um, in regards to um, 
uh, maybe a project or a program that you guys are working on that you'd like to ha highlight? Yeah, I think uh, area of focus has been around officer safety and wellness. So Bureau of Justice Assistance has programs around that, and so does IACP. And that's uh, really, as we went out and talked to customers in law enforcement, we, did, we actually conducted our own research study last year with VDC, and that was the number one problem that law enforcement was faced with. And it really comes down to having better situational awareness and less distracted driving. When you look at the officer fatalities in 2017, 42% of all those fatalities were single vehicle collisions. So the reality today, Luke, is that life happens, right? We have smartphones, we have our in-car computers, plus we have all of the other things that are happening, and the numbers are just too high. There's a lot of groups that are focused on reducing the number of collisions and deaths. What we've done is we've now created purpose-built solutions around officer safety. We're trying to, in a really good way, create less distraction, better use of the technology. We talked earlier about so much information, so much data coming in, that how do I go through a street and do a license plate check, for example, by using voice? There's really no reason that I can't do a license plate search via voice. When I get a message and I'm already dispatched in my CAD, and now I get an update that the person has fled the scene, why do I need to go back and look at my CAD screen? Why can't I have a message read to me? Right, or right? Even a video. Or video. To, so what we've know. done is we've introduced that. We've got two proof of concepts already underway with two law enforcement agencies. And I think we're going to solve that this year in a way that's really going to reduce deaths and help law enforcement get more information at the moments that they need it. That's fantastic. It's sad to hear that about the, uh, that statistic. Mike, how about in, uh, in Fairfax County? You want to talk about a specific program that you guys are uh, working on that would be of interest to the audience? Well, I don't know that I really have a specific program because we're doing everything here. And, and, and a lot of people don't realize that at the local level, we do exactly everything the federal government's doing, the well, states are doing. That's what it doing. all comes down to, the local I think, level, I think right? for me, Luke, uh, one, uh, a selfish part for me is, you know, it's cybersecurity is my concern with, with what I do in my normal job. Uh, in the National Capital Region, from an emergency management standpoint, I think what we're concerned with uh, as uh, CISOs is the communication part of when there is an issue with a critical infrastructure provider. And critical infrastructure has gone way beyond what anyone ever thought it would be. We have, you know, we have our, um, our phone systems, we have uh, a multitude of things that are going on, but so like when we have an incident now, the emergency management agency, th they've done this time and time again so they can manage the incident, they can get things going, but what we're noticing from a cyber side when there's a cyber incident, we, um, we're not brought into the loop. And for me, I'm trying to figure out in the, uh, the NIMS piece of that, where do we bring cyber in and then where, is, uh, where are the critical infrastructure providers being um, brought into the, the, the table to say, give us, the, we, I, I need to know if you had a cyber incident, what it was about, and we've got to be able to, to have that trust to where they can communicate that to us today. Because today, when those things happen in those critical infrastructure provider networks and things, we're not notified. And it is, it's, a, it's a problem for us because the one thing that we have to answer to is our citizens. So if they don't have 911 capabilities because it's down, if they don't have um, power, they're, not, they're, they're gonna do one phone call to that power company, but a majority, 99% of all the other calls now are gonna come to the local. Interesting nexus there with, uh, you know, we think about, you know, sort of uh, Mother Nature and, and uh, you know, sort of the, all the incidents that we've experienced over the last couple of years, but clearly uh, cyber is yet another uh, incident that has to be responded to from an emergency response the same way. Well, uh, that's a fascinating uh, um, uh, sort of nexus there. Um, <clears throat> well, we're going to follow back up in just a minute, uh, but first we're going to take a short break. Uh, you've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. With me on today's show are Rear Admiral Ron Hewitt, Director, Office of Emergency Communications, <coughs> Department of Homeland Security, Mark Lucero, 
chief engineer, integrated public alert and warning systems uh, at FEMA, Michael Dent, chief information security officer, Fairfax County, uh, Kent Kildow, director, business continuity and emergency management, Verizon, and Scott Landau, director of business development, Panasonic Mobile Solutions. Uh, we were talking about specific programs, and I'd like to go uh, to you, Ken, and talk about uh, uh, you know, what's going on in Verizon, maybe a specific <coughs> program that you'd like to share with our community. Sure. Uh, first, I'd just like to say that we recognize the importance of taking both existing and uh, new technologies and enhancing them and packaging them in order to provide solutions for the government agencies and first responders that we support. Um, that has led us for, to a few things. First, in May, uh, our wireless priority services over Vaulty reached full operating capacity, which uh, is providing end-to-end -end voice priority and data connection priority for uh, those that use that service. I would also note that those services meet the Office of Emergency Communication uh, interoperability policies. Uh, we feel it's important that we uh, follow those guidelines. Uh, second, you know, in April, we launched a new network for secure and resilient communications for uh, agencies engaged in national security activity as well as first responders. Uh, that is a dedicated private core network that provides preemption, broadband priority, and guaranteed quality of service for those uh, first responders, uh, ensuring they have the ability to stay connected during a crisis. And then finally, uh, just this week, we've announced the availability of a mobile connectivity trailer that will give agencies the ability to uh, connect through satellite or through an ISP and stand up a temporary communications network uh, within uh, as little as an hour. Uh, and that's going to be available for agencies through lease to own or through purchase. And uh, another great asset that will be available for, uh, for first responders. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, a lot of that uh, uh, capability, the uh, agencies used to have to sort of fit out themselves. So it's fantastic that they can just buy this capability, sort of drop it into an environment and connect it back to the, uh, the backhaul uh, mm -hmm. uh, capability there. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, Ron, let's ask you, uh, what, uh, tell us about a program that's going on in, uh, in emergency comm at DHS that uh, is gonna be of interest to our, our listening audience. Was Michael Dent alluded to within the National Incident Management System, the Incident Command System structure, which is way uh, the first responders form and and uh, and work during an incident, doesn't right now account for cybersecurity or even information technology. Uh, right now, the, underneath the logistics section chief, uh, there's a communications unit, which we uh, help train and support on that, but it is focused just on land mobile radio. And so working with our public safety associations that uh, support the Department of Homeland Security. It's called SAFECOM. It's made up of the National Sheriff's Association, International Police Chiefs, the Fire Chiefs, Major City uh, Police and Fire Chiefs all got together and said we've got to address this huge gap because we're seeing more and more broadband being come in and we need to be able to set up our applications, our wireless networks and stuff. And so just earlier this, this uh, month we uh, had the SAFECOM task force for uh, this communications section uh, conduct an alpha course or the uh, first actually prototype of a uh, information technology services leader course which is training uh, first responders on how to uh, set up wireless networks bring in applications, make sure, and then also provide cybersecurity to the incident commander. And uh, next month we'll be down in Houston. Houston was an early builder uh, for broadband in, in public safety environments. Uh, we'll be hosting uh, the second course down there and we hope to have it uh, online by the end of this year. And uh, we'll run it up through FEMA. It's similar if you think about how DOD uh, responds, they use the joint operations and, mm -hmm. and planning and uh, mm -hmm. uh, execution system, the JOPE system. They have a J6, which is focused on uh, the kind of the 
uh, chief information officer, that whole information management, we're looking within the uh, NIMS ICS to be able to bring in a communications section chief to have that same <coughs> ability to manage the information across the entire incident. Yeah, I mean, it's really a fascinating, if you think about it, you know, the, 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 uh, the broad use of the technology in this environment and running the critical infrastructure, et cetera, and the fact that, you know, the actual disruption of the technology sh could become the incident and perhaps the technology that's being actually used in the emergency response ecosystem is sort of a, a double whammy there. It's a fascinating concept there. Mark, uh, let's uh, talk about, uh, I always like to talk about uh, the lessons learned and things that the uh, community ought to be thinking about that uh, if you've experienced uh, running this program. So you could perhaps share some lessons learned uh, for the community that uh, you know they can um, take advantage of. Sure, um, I think uh, just by nature of uh, the iPod system and these these alert technologies, uh, by definition, they're not really used very often. They're used maybe once a year, because it's really that uh, you, when you need to reach as many people as possible, uh, that's when you would use a system. Um, Subscription-based notification systems are used a lot. That's the one where you sign up for text messages and things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, practitioners, they use those. They're very proficient with those tools. But when it comes to uh, these uh, highly uh, disruptive uh, alerts, I don't think that they get uh, as much seat time with, with this type of alerting uh, methods. So uh, one of the lessons learned over the past year is that you know while we've seen an uptick in usage, we've also seen an uptick in uh, some mistakes that have been made. Mm. Uh, so we have been focused uh, uh, recently on improving our training programs that FEMA provides for how to use the system, how to use it effectively. And uh, also we are highly encouraging uh, practitioners to test their systems. Um, in fact, uh, just this April, uh, uh, the National Capital Region, uh, there were 13 jurisdictions. It was uh, led by Fairfax County, uh, and they did a, an excellent job in herding the cats. Uh, they issued an alert that uh, was probably received by the, uh, the entire listening area here in the National Capital Region. Uh, they identified a few um, speed bumps, I guess hurdles, that they were able to overcome when they did that test. But those are things that they wouldn't have known unless they tested. Sure. So we're really encouraging people to train and test on these systems bef train, before they train, do them. Train, train, and obviously in, a, in the, uh, the time of uh, an incident and, you know, the heat's on, there's a lot of uh, uh, potential chaos there. You want to have that sort of uh, baked in and hardwired. Uh, Kent, how about at Verizon? Any lessons learned you'd like to share with the uh, community? Well, thank you, Luke. Um, I think we'd like to start with the idea that collaboration continues to be critically important to uh, developing a robust response to emergencies. Uh, we start uh, with exercises, both internal to the company, as well as with our federal and uh, state government agency partners. Uh, we participate in as many of the uh, national level exercises as we can, as well as state exercises, so that we can build those uh, relationships and those uh, working partnerships in advance. Uh, but we take that a step further and really see the need to collaborate both with industry partners and governments to try, uh, agencies to try to create new solutions. And uh, we developed what we call uh, offer Operations Convergent Response, where we bring a number of those organizations together and through a series of real world scenarios, uh, try to develop new uh, solutions uh, collaboratively. Uh, examples would be a flood situation where we actually have an area that's flooded and we uh, can execute rescues and uh, work on how do we better share information uh, as well as uh, situations like a chemical release in a subway system and how do those uh, organizations uh, make sure that all the current information is available, shared as quickly as possible, and uh, available to all the agencies. Um, that, uh, that is an ongoing effort that we will uh, replicate again this year and work on things like um, connected solutions, how do we better share data, especially when it's large data sets, real time so that uh, the situational awareness is available right away, as well as working on uh, uh, connected, uh, excuse me, smart city applications as well. So a lot of scenario-based training, which I think is, uh, is uh, really important there uh, in regards to just, uh, you know, uh, learn, repeat, et cetera. Mike, how about at Fairfax County? Any lessons learned there you want to 
Well, I, I think, you know, with the examples that have already been given, um, the, the test that was run by our emergency management, collaboration, Kent, as you said, it's critical. The problem there is you have the emergency management agency is running a test, but the rest, and understand they're in a local network or a state network, you have an IT department that supports that agency when they're not involved and that test happens, everyone's asking what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things happen and that's where to me, one of the biggest lessons I think we're learning in this region is if you don't collaborate, you're going you're gonna to end up making an emergency event even worse because people aren't going to be able to communicate. So I think what we've learned, our emergency management office now has gone down the, the path of trying to do a lot of their cyber training and, and learning things, but at the same time they're bringing the subject matter experts in now so that we could be a part of making sure those lessons they train on are real and they're going to actually help them when an event does occur. Yeah, bringing the whole community together inclusively because yeah. let's face it, during an emergency it's going to be all hands on deck, right? right. And so um, it makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> Admiral Hewitt, how about uh, over at DHS? I'm sure you've got some lessons learned that you'd like to share with the community. Yes, thanks, Luke. Yeah. And uh, just about every time when you look at an incident that went bad, it's generally uh, results in something to do with the communications. And, and the focus goes right in on the equipment. But as we uh, analyze and look into the situation, it almost 80% of the time it's a human error sure. and, and so uh, you know it's it's like the saying goes if you're exchanging business cards at the incident it's probably because you're trying to find someone to blame for what went wrong yeah. it's way too late right so you want to heard that one but I guess it makes sense <laughs> you you if and, and so really what we focus on and, and SafeCom that organization that uh, the, the group of uh, public safety organizations that advise uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security has developed the SafeCom interoperability continuum, which uh, uh, states that uh, when to really drive good communications interoperability so all the responders can talk to each other, you need to have governance that develops plans before the incident that tells the uh, practitioners how to actually use the equipment, develop standard operating procedures around uh, how to use the uh, equipment that you're going to be uh, having at the incident, and then train and exercise jointly so that you're, uh, when you achieve interoperability when you need it most at the incident. Um, it seems like uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a real challenge, too, because you've got to have state local, um, you know, federal, you know, all tied into this, right? Both the, uh, the equipment, obviously, from, the, from a, just a, a pure technical communications, but obviously from a, a people and process type thing, right? I mean, uh, is that something that sort of gets included in this? Yes, and so that is part sort of the, the governance. The full spectrum. And, and pretty much every major area now has, has a group that gets together uh, routinely to, to look over, look at where they are with their technology, and, mm -hmm. then, and then come together and make sure that the standard operating procedures are up to date and fits into uh, how they want to. Yeah, and it respond. seems like, you know, at a county level, you would have, uh, you know, Mike, that uh, as you guys are testing sort of all-inclusive to make sure that, you know, every uh, sort of county employee that needs to get involved in an emergency response does get involved, but there's always a, uh, a national and a federal sort of play to that as well. And I'm sure that gets exercised into that environment um, uh, when you're running through those drills. Oh, definitely, yeah. especially, I mean, being where we're at, look, it, the federal government, you know, and the state, we're all in this area. Um, the beauty of, um, like, the NCR that we have, uh, bringing, bringing the federal agencies in if there's an incident to that network, the onboarding process for that maybe takes an hour. And that's all, wow. but it, it all goes back to people, though, because you're depending on somebody to give you info. But once the info's there, we can onboard any any agency coming into that network, probably within an hour. You know, as as long as their their uh, technology in the back end is working the way it's supposed to for, you know, Active Directory or whatever that solution is you use in your uh, your entity. Then, and it doesn't matter to us really what it is. We we've been able to onboard you know, so many agencies coming in when we've had issues or incidents that we need them to get to that network. And it, it They're really laying out that ecosystem so that any uh, 
uh, layer of the system can snap into the yep. environment. Scott, how about over at Panasonic? Uh, can you share some lessons learned that you guys have experienced over uh, a period of time that uh, uh, you'd like to share with the community? Yeah, thanks, Luke. Well, I was very appreciative when Rear Admiral Hewitt mentioned that there's majority of the time it's not an equipment failure. We've worked very, very hard at Panasonic to... Certainly not a tough book, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, we, we, we are very purpose-built in terms of what we're providing to the community, whether it's our enterprise customers, our federal customers, or public safety. Right. And I think it's, it's at the point where people expect a low failure rate, right? They expect it to work. But the lessons that we've learned now are that there's so much information that we talked about earlier, and to support the programs of FEMA, DHS, and customers like Fairfax County, what we're trying to do is make that much more manageable at the edge, right? So we really sort of live at the edge. Today, real-time crime centers get so much good information. And the truth is that CAD dispatchers, real-time crime centers are very, very busy. So what if the officer or the firefighter, the EMT, had access to that same information at their fingertips in a much more usable way. And that's really been the conversation. We've, our solutions team has met with over 100 customers just this year in the last six months to talk about how do we decide how can we work closer with some of the partners in the ecosystem. So I mentioned some things around voice and multi-factor authentication. But Panasonic has a large footprint within automotive space, for example. So we've met with all of the major manufacturers that provide public safety vehicles to say, how can we do a better job integrating with those microphones, with those sensors? Most of the info that are, you know, the dash videos that are in that I was thinking about when you were talking about the, uh, uh, you know, having a voice command on a, uh, on a license plate, right? You could have a license plate reader that just, you know, sort of, yeah. Yeah, and we're actually in trials for some of those things. Mm -hmm. And even most of the infotainment systems are in vehicles are Panasonic. Mm -hmm. So we're leveraging our internal uh, capabilities and external partners. And I think what we've learned is that by doing that, we can provide a better solution. Yeah, you know, it's uh, um, there's a, a saying out there now with the, uh, the automobiles that, you know, the automobiles isn't really a... Uh, machine with four tires and a steering wheel. It's really a computer with, uh, you know, that's got uh, four tires and a steering wheel on it. And I think there's a lot of capability uh, when you get into that sort of connected environment to use a lot of that uh, um, uh, capability as it moves around and brings in information and yeah. pass it around in regards to even an emergency response. Uh, situation. <clears throat> it's fascinating. Well, we're going to um, uh, close this section out and we'll be back and talk about challenges on our last segment. Um, but right now, we need to take a short break. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. All right. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Um, with me on today's show are Rear Admiral Ron Hewitt, Director, Office of Emergency Communications, Homeland Security, Mark Lucero, Chief Engineer, Alert, uh, Integrated Public Alert and Warning System with FEMA, Mike Dent, Chief Information Security Officer, Fairfax County, Ken Kildow, Director, Business Continuity and Emergency Management, Verizon, and Scott Landau, Director of Business Development, Panasonic Mobile Solutions. Uh, we were going to start talking about the major challenges, and Kent, I want to throw it over to you and talk about what challenges do you see Verizon having in this environment? Well, I'd like to build on a couple of points that Admiral Hewitt draw, drew out in the last uh, question. Mm -hmm. And first is the importance of interoperability. Uh, you know, one of the lessons learned coming out of 9-11 was the challenges that some of the agencies had communicating uh, during the response and really the uh, work that's been done to build that interoperability since then, uh, especially in the form of GETS and WEPS and the standard um, 
ability to prioritize and transfer uh, both voice and data sessions across networks and maintain that priority service. Uh, having that going forward is going to be uh, critical because not every agency is going to land on the same network uh, or choose the same solution as we move ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so maintaining that interoperability is key. The other thing uh, I think he uh, started to bring out was the importance of open architecture. Uh, if you have open architecture, a number of agencies and uh, uh, industry partners can bring solutions to bear that will apply across uh, the networks and be usable by all. Extremely critical as we continue to uh, take a look at things like data sharing for situational awareness and smart city applications. So those two things I think are going to be important for all of us to consider as we move into uh, new technologies. Sure. Uh, Ron, how about the challenges at DHS? You know, we sort of talked about some of them there, but uh, can you give us a sort of a, an outline of some of these other challenges that you guys are facing? Was uh, Ken alluded to, uh, you know, last year was unprecedented hurricane season, right? Mm -hmm. You had uh, Harvey hitting uh, Houston, and then you had Irma and, and Maria coming up uh, through Puerto Rico. And uh, you have to look at resiliency of your systems, and, and you're going to have you know the primary which is your land mobile radio but what are you going to you, you know what are you going to do when you know, your towers go down and so uh, as Ken alluded to we've been working with all the carriers to uh, uh, make sure that as they migrate to 4G long-term uh, evolution uh, capabilities on their cellular towers that we uh, provide priority services it's wireless priority services so uh, when you do have congestion uh, first responders can dial star 272 the number and and that call gets through and and, uh, and that's it works critical. every time. It works right. every time. Uh, very important. And it's critical because it may be, uh, you know, trying to get a uh, hospital bed when you're uh, taking an ambulance, uh, you know, the, with with uh, someone who just had a major injury. So it's, sure. it's critical that call goes through. Yeah. Uh, Scott, how about a Panasonic? Uh, can you lay out some challenges that uh, you guys see out there that you're uh, wrestling with and solving? Yeah, I mean, I think we've all talked about it in a way, Luke, that there's so much technology and so many different systems that are available today that what the challenge that we see is making it less complicated. Right. Right. I mean. Especially in an emergency situation where it needs to be simple. It needs to be simple. I mean, our, everyone simple relies on muscle memory. Right. Mm -hmm. The training is such a key element of that. And being able to do things in an easier way. If you're really going to solve things like officer safety and distracted driving, it can't be difficult. Right. And it can't be expensive. Right. You know, we also talked about budgets and grants being sort of tighter and really challenging. So, you know, to us, it's keeping it simple, leveraging existing investments, but making everyone safer. Sure. Mark, how about at FEMA? Uh, what are the challenges that you guys are wrestling right now and solving? Yeah. Uh, so for public alert and warning, I mean, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is just matching the pace of technology. Um, I mean, there's, there's so much capability in a cell phone today, right. you, and the public expectation is that I can stream, you know, live video, 4K video from my drone, uh, but yet here we are saying, you know, oh, you can send a 90-character alert to the phone. So we really need to uh, make some improvements in, in, in the way that these alerts are delivered and take advantage of some of those uh, advances in technology. So the, I guess the, the silver lining is that we have a, a pretty good relationship with the regulatory uh, with the uh, standards bodies and with the, the, the cell carriers uh, and the manufacturers to ensure that we can take advantage of some of those things. Right, just the challenges of, of, of sort of uh, aligning with all this emergency technology that's moving so quickly. Mike, how about at Fairfax County? Uh, what well, are the Luke, challenges uh, again, that you guys are the, solving? The panel here, everyone's talked about it. Resiliency, collaboration, open architecture, open, open application, system development life cycle. There are still a lot of vendors out there that are developing applications that r force us as a, a, a network enterprise mm. to have to isolate those applications because there's vulnerabilities you know, in, in some of the development tools they're using to, and how they developed it. So they're still being able to sell these things on the market as an emergency management or public safety you know, tool. And yet we can't even, we can't pass them through our standards to get, put them on our network but it becomes a life and death critical situation, then we're forced to, so then we have to build security around that. So making sure 
that the vendors in them are building applications to standards, you know, this era standards versus, you know, the 90s, where a lot of things back then, they were the way they were. Now we have so many things happening out there. There's so many vulnerabilities that, or, or you know, malicious attacks waiting to get to networks. And some of these apps that come in, they're, they're open right from the get-go, and they need to work on making sure they're secure when they come out. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, dynamic environment these days, and certainly want to make sure that there's interoperability and that, you know, the counties and, you know, the, the, the various user bases don't have to become the integrator, so to speak. All right, well, we like to wrap it up with uh, sort of uh, outlining a vision of the future, and we're going to start with you, Kent, at Verizon. You know, paint a picture of what the listening audience can expect. What is Verizon thinking about, you know, as they look into the future? Well, we, we see this as a very exciting time. Uh, one of the things that we say is that we don't wait for the future, we build it. And uh, we're doing that in a couple of ways right now. Uh, first, you've probably heard about the Intelligent Edge Network. Uh, it's our next generation network that will uh, apply some of the uh, edge computing technology in uh, f virtualization of some of the networking functions to increase uh, the capabilities and the resiliency of the network. The other thing that I think everyone is talking about right now is the deployment of the 5G network. And the reduction of latency in the network is going to enable a number of exciting things for uh, government agencies and first responders. The ability to share large data sets uh, much faster than ever before and apply uh, artificial intelligence to do analytics and provide actionable information to first responders is going to be uh, a very exciting uh, evolution of things in the near future. Uh, that along with the application of smart cities technology, it's just going to be a, a number of exciting uh, opportunities for first responders in the near future. Of, uh, uh, just exploding of capability. When can we expect to see that 5G across mm -hmm. the country? Well, we've uh, committed for a deployment of three in three to five cities this year. Uh, that's going to get the, uh, the technology out there where we will be able to continue to uh, expand and improve those capabilities. Um, the rest of the deployment schedule hasn't been released yet, okay. but uh, it's, it's uh, right around the, the top corner, of our list. Like. Scott, give us a picture of the future in regards to where Panasonic stands. Yeah, so Luke, I'm very proud to be a member of Panasonic, and I'm very proud of our dedication to our customers, whether they're enterprise customers, federal customers, or public safety. I spend most of my time with public safety, so where I see the future is around converged devices. We've talked a lot about the connected vehicle, and I think as we move down the pipeline, and Kent spoke about it, we're going to have really robust networks that are going to allow so much information to be communicated and collaborated between the first responders we're going to have a lot of access to artificial intelligence. So when you think about someone driving down the road and being drowsy, being able to get an alert that I'm in a rural area and now I'm getting tired is really critical, right? Getting information about other responders to the incident, getting better situational awareness, being able to do federated queries at a user level right, based on the incident that I'm going to respond to, being able to de-escalate because I've got such better information in the three to five minutes that I'm responding. So I think there's such great information out there that our focus is around, again, making that simpler, easy to use, and enhancing the safety of our community and the community that they serve. And I would imagine that you're playing a big role, Panasonic is, and the uh, sort of autonomous vehicle sort of movement, right? Um, yes, we are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So then, and that gets very exciting, right? Because now you have the capability of leveraging that to be able to provide more and more sensors, more and more information in a, in a much safer way. Right, yeah. and do it at high speed with 5G. <laughs> Uh, you're really essentially going to have these rolling sort of micro uh, data centers, if you will, uh, that are picking up a lot of sensing information and being able to use that and share that information, which is fascinating. Right. Mike, how about at uh, Fairfax County? What, what, is, uh, what does the future look like in regards to... The future looks like all the technology they just talked about mm -hmm. making it affordable. 
<laughs> for <it> us. <laughs> because it's, it sounds great, but it's very expensive right now. So mm -hmm. I think the technology is going to be, become, you know, it, it's going to get to a point where it, it, it's going to be so sophisticated, it's going to be a lot easier to manufacture the things that they're doing. It will be affordable um, because, you know, simple things like body-worn camera right now, storage costs, those things, we're seeing those things come down. So those, those capabilities for smaller jurisdictions, are, I think, are going to get a lot better because right now the affordability of data storage for body-worn video is, is very expensive to a, a smaller jurisdiction. Sure. Um, artificial intelligence, it's out there. We're using it in Fairfax on, in some of the technology we have. I think it's, uh, it's going to really go far in integrating all these solutions so that an officer has one look at an incident. It, it, it has all the information that they need. I know there's other some jurisdictions that are getting there. But I think to see that come out and across in artificial intelligence, I think is going to be the 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 backbone of making sure that works. And it seemed like you know it, it just the uh, body worn camera, as you were saying, that you had this uh, capability out there, and the local uh, jurisdictions were having to sort of you know uh, you know integrate all these things together, buy the cameras, buy the storage, find a way to connect it. And I know now that that uh, is being offered as a service, which is a big deal. They really sort of lower that cost, and then they're they're allowing you know AI on top of the video to do the analysis, and you can sort of uh, subscription-based type of capability. I would imagine that's an easier way for a local jurisdiction to buy it yep. and also um, afford it. Right. Uh, it seems like, uh, Mark. How about at FEMA? Tell us uh, sort of let us. Uh, uh, give us some insight as to what we can expect as far as the uh, alert warning system uh, and, and sort of uh, in, in those, uh, those times of need, so to speak. Sure. Um, so I've got a, a list of 175 bullets, yeah. my wish list of all the things. Okay. Uh, well, we've got about three minutes to give it. So, <laughs> but, uh, so, so here's a little yeah. secret, though. Things kind of take a long time to get done in the government. That's a secret. Yeah. Um, but I think that the way that we can overcome some of that. It's getting better, though. It is getting better, absolutely. Um, so we've, we've, we've kind of, uh, I guess we've future-proofed this system and using an open standard so that interoperability uh, becomes easy. Uh, so I think uh, 14 years ago, I saw a prototype. It was a toaster that had a Wi-Fi connection that would toast your toast in the morning, toast your bread, and it would imprint the weather for the day. Um, somebody thought of that 14 years ago. Uh, where is that today? Uh, I mean, imagine a toaster that's going to give you an alert, or, or, and that's kind of far-fetched. But really, uh, in reality, uh, if you are streaming video or you're, you're on your PlayStation or what have you, you're, you're going to be disconnected pretty much. How do we get those people connected to alerts? Uh, so those are the types of things that we're looking at in the future. How can we harness some of these uh, different uh, technologies you wouldn't think of as being an alert and warning device, but making them into alert and warning devices? And I think the way that we do that is by using those open standards that we've uh, adopted and, uh, and performing those integrations, using that, leveraging that uh, public-private partnership so that the the investment is done by these companies that are a little more agile to get things done quickly uh, as opposed to the government going out and building these on their own. So the, an example of sort of these different types of platforms, devices that you're trying to reach to uh, to be able to communicate, you know, uh, in an emergency would be what, for example? Uh, so I mentioned the PlayStation. Uh, we we sent a bunch of folks out to the CES this year and just uh, you know infiltrated, uh, mm -hmm. trying trying to to get them to understand the importance of uh, alert and warning, uh, building it into their products because they're all connected, uh, and it's it's a simple matter of going out and fetching an alert and and presenting it to the user. Uh, so uh, gaming systems, streaming uh, media. Um, there, there, there are a number of things. And they're actually on my 175 list. Sure. So anything that's sort of connected, right, that has you online, but maybe not, uh, you know, in the earshot of a radio, et cetera. You want to get, you know, sort of channeled into that, so you can in uh, vehicle systems, right, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, that's uh, super important. And uh, right, as we sort of expand our environment here. All right, Ron, you're going to take us home here in regards to what does the future look like as far as emergency comms in respect to Department of Homeland Security? Well, Luke, you and I and all American citizens uh, today take uh, sending uh, text, videos, pictures for granted. 
well, you can't send a picture or a video to a 911 center or a public safety mm -hmm. answering point Good today. Point. And so uh, moving into the future as we help the states and the over 6,000 uh, public safety answering points migrate to next generation 911, uh, which uh, they're setting up emergency services IP networks now and to be able to uh, uh, retrain them because right now they're only in the voice mode. I mean, 25% are able to s receive text, and most of them aren't. So, really? just 25%. Yeah, just 25%. And we wow, take it amazing. for granted, right? And mm -hmm. and yet, if you had to send a text to a 911 center today, almost ar around the country, you'd get a kickback saying, "Please dial 911 if this is an emergency." Well, that's good to know. But but with You're that, within that 25 percent. But I within guess, Fairfax, yeah. you can't send a picture or a video to a 911 center. Right. And in the future, where we're headed, uh, when you have a lost loved one, it would be nice to be able to send your picture of that lost loved one into mm -hmm. the 911 center to have the networks and the systems available that it would get out to public safety. And in the future as Mark alluded to, to be able to even send those pictures out on the alerts and warnings. We can't do that today, but with everybody around the table working together, we're gonna to be able to do that and make this a safer nation. And the, uh, I was just thinking about the reverse 911, I think it's called, right? Where, uh, is that through FEMA or how does that work? Or wh wh who runs that environment? Maybe you can explain what reverse 911 is for people that uh, yeah. might not know what that is. Um, so emergency telephone notification systems, that's right. that uh, uh, automated system that will dial phone numbers automatically and mm -hmm. deliver a message. Uh, those, are, those are not provided through FEMA, those are provided through these uh, 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 emergency management uh, console systems that they use. Uh, they're, they're commercial products. Uh, that uh, emergency management adopts. So that the local uh, jurisdictions will use to just get out to the community and yet another venue to uh, be able to send some information out, maybe sort of a local type of situation. Yep. Another tool for the tool bag. Fascinating subject, and this is something that we could talk about all afternoon, a very important one. I want to thank all of you. Um, I'd like to thank today's guests for taking the time from their busy schedules to join us for this super important program and this super important subject. I'd also like to thank the sponsor for Without We Don't Have a Show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Radio that make our program so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank the listening audience out there that tune in every month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM and Federal News Radio dot com.